I was shaving this morning and thinking about how grateful I was for a new day. I didn't, uh, I didn't smile while I was shaving. You don't get a good shave that way. But I was smiling inside and got to thinking more about what the Lord offers us as gifts that, uh, that we really need as human beings. Just when you think about the march of time. Just a few weeks ago, we were glad to receive a new year. And we get a new year every year because of the way God has put things together. A, a year measures that process that God has made of our planet revolving around the sun every 365 and one quarter days. And we're often thankful that it's just a new month. We get one of those tomorrow. Sometimes we just think, if I can just make it to the end of this month... And we have months because of the relation that God has made the earth to have to the moon. And then there are weeks. This is the beginning of a new week. Sometimes we're just ready for a new week. I'll come back to that one in just a minute. Sometimes just a new day. If I can make it through today and say tomorrow's another day. We're grateful, and, and we get that new day because of how God has made the earth to rotate so predictably every 24 hours. That week, though, there's no natural explanation for that at all. When you look at heavenly bodies or the way our planet works, that goes back to God telling us what He did in Genesis chapter 1. He made the earth in a week. Six days of creation, and on the seventh day he rested. So we shouldn't start a new week for sure without thinking of God. But then this morning, I was especially grateful that today is the first day of the week, which for almost 21 centuries now has meant it's the Lord's day. Because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Every day that begins a week is the Lord's day in a special way. And we are blessed to be with the Lord's people and pay special attention to our Lord on the first day of the week. And it's a privilege to me to get to spend it with you. We've been thinking about being just like Jesus. The Bible calls us in one way and another to be just like Jesus, our Lord. That could mean lots of things to lots of people, but the Bible spelled it out very specifically what God wants whenever He wants us to be like Jesus. In our first lesson in this series, our first lesson of this year, we studied from John chapter 13, where Jesus washed the feet of His disciples with the love He had with them for them to the very end. In verse 15, He said, "...for I have given you an example." that you also should do just as I have done to you. We ought to desire to serve just like Jesus. In that same chapter, our, our second lesson challenged us to love just like Jesus. In verse 34 of John chapter 13, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, that wasn't new. God's people had been hearing that for a long, long time. But Jesus continued, Just as I have loved you, you also ought to love one another. The last time we got to study this series together, we looked at 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, Whoever says he abides in him, in Jesus, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And the preceding verses help us to see that that means an obedience to God, doing right to the best of our ability all the time and not wrong. Well, this lesson was for last week, but I wasn't here. And I appreciate Josh filling in so ably with such a good and encouraging lesson on confidence when we pray. Today, it's about this, suffer just like Jesus. That comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. If you'd open your Bibles there with me. It's a popular thing today to say that I want to be my best version of me. I want to be a better me. 
The other day I read something that someone shared. It said, I found that trying to be more like Jesus yields far better results than trying to be a better me. Would you agree? You're going to get far better results from trying to be like Jesus than just trying to be a better you. We want to serve like Jesus. We want to love like Jesus. We want to obey like Jesus. But you really got to be focused on Jesus and, and you have to love Jesus to want to suffer like Jesus. But the Bible says that's what you need to do. In verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Maybe we'd have been surprised to find this in the ways that God says he wants us to be like Jesus, but there it is very directly. He's left us an example here that we might follow in his steps. Now, out of all the, the specific texts that we have studied, this passage might have some words that are more familiar than the rest because of a book that a guy wrote over a century ago now. Charles Sheldon wrote a book titled In His Steps. And he wrote that because he got to wondering about what would it be like if always in my life and everybody else in their lives, whatever we were going to do, we would ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? So he wrote that over a century ago and is an inspirational book about 25 years ago. Someone took that and it became the popular thing in Christian circles. What would Jesus do? Maybe some of you wore a WWJD bracelet or a shirt or something like that. What would Jesus do? Well, he titled his book, as I said, In His Steps. And that comes very specifically from verse 21. Verse 21 says that Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. There are several Greek words that are translated in Scripture example. This one is found only here in all of Scripture. But whenever you look for it in other literature from the first century, you find out that it was often used this way. As a school teacher would give students a wax tablet and up at the, at the top would inscribe whatever letters they were going to learn to write today. And so the students could feel those letters, they could look at those letters, they could take their stylus and try to copy that letter into the wax tablet. And the copy was called a hoopagramos. Well, that's the same word here translated an example. Christ left us an example to copy. Jessica and I the other night watched a movie called The First Grader. Anybody ever seen that movie? It's kind of obscure. I found it on uh, Amazon Prime. It's a pretty good movie, but it's based on a true story. It wasn't until 2003 that the country of Kenya over in Africa began to provide a free public education. Kids were growing up without learning to read or write unless they had money. Well, whenever they began to advertise on the radio and elsewhere, 84-year-old Muragi wanted to take them up on it. Now, when this started out, the government wasn't thinking of 84-year-old men. They were thinking of kids. But he went to this uh, school where they were about to start. Everybody was supposed to bring a birth certificate to show that they're really Kenyan to get this free education. So you got all these kids who are there. Their parents have come with the birth certificates. And it's really a wild scene because of how badly everybody wanted education. But then here comes 84-year-old Maragi. No, you can't come to school here. This is for kids. And so they ran him off once. And he came back the next day, and they ran him off again. He came back another day, and they ran him off. But he really had captured the heart of the head teacher at that school. 
And so the young lady finally decided to let him in, and she took a lot of flack for it. But Maragi was a good influence in the class of which he was a part. In the movie, at least, he sat next to a little boy who just could not get the number five right. It was backwards every time, and he would fill a whole page with fives that were backwards. One day at recess, they're sitting outside. Most of the kids are playing, but Maragi didn't play every day at recess, being 84 years old. But the little boy came and sat down beside him, and, and he said, I'd like to help you with the number five. So Maragi had a, a stick that he used for walking and for lots of other stuff, but they're sitting there uh, on the bench, and in the dust below, he takes his stick, and, and he draws out a number five the correct way. And he told the boy a way to help him remember how to do it. He said, long neck, belly is fat, number five, wears a hat. And he gave his stick to the boy and he said it again. L long neck, belly is fat, number five, wears a hat. And the boy said it to himself. Long neck, belly is fat, number five, wears a hat. And he got it. He got it by following Moragi's example. So we're supposed to copy Jesus. He left us an example, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says. Not only that, John or Peter emphasizes it in another way. At the end of the chapter, it says that he wants us to follow in his steps. So an example, he wants us to copy him, to follow in his steps, to follow in his footprints. Now, where should I go from here? Uh, what path should I take? Here it is. The trail was blazed by Jesus, following his spiritual and moral tracks. You know, when I read a verse like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, and Jesus wants me to copy his example, and he wants me to follow in his footsteps, it convinces me that it couldn't be more important for me to immerse myself, to read over and over and over again about the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of the Bible is important. It's equally important. And when we come to all the letters that Paul wrote, the letter that James wrote, and, and Hebrews, and, and hear what Peter is writing, and the letters that John wrote, and we hear instruction, 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 command, command. Those are so important. But we see them fleshed out in Jesus, in his example, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the steps that he walked, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't let yourself go very long without reading through one of the Gospels. I'm not surprised that there are four of them right there at the beginning of our New Testament. God wants us to copy His Son. He wants us to walk in His footsteps. But you get to verse 21 from verses 18 to 20. It says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called... Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. When you get to verse 21, if you've read the few verses before that, you find out that the challenge is to do right when you're not being treated right. Verse 21 really informs my attitude in all kinds of suffering. And there's plenty of it in life. But in the context, it's about when I'm not being treated right for doing right. And in history, there, there's not been a class of people so routinely mistreated 
as slaves. We have one of the words for slaves in the New Testament when we read servants in verse 18. Servants with masters. There's no class of people that's been so routinely mistreated as slaves, but the gospel has been the undoing of slavery wherever it's gone and wherever it's been widely embraced. When, when people have seen the dignity of every human being created in the image of God, so valuable to God that he would give his son for that person, well, that's often been the undoing of, of slavery on the part of those who would hold slaves and approve of slavery. And on the other side of it, when mistreated people have proven themselves morally superior to the people who are enslaving them, by living out a passage like this, that's been the undoing of slavery. But this passage teaches us to do right when it's hard and to do right even when it hurts. That's what Jesus did. I read in verses 18 through 20 three times the word endure. And that's what this passage is about. It's not just about suffering. It's about enduring suffering the way that Jesus did. To this you have been called. It's not that Christians are called to suffer. Everybody in the world does that. But we're called to endure suffering just like Jesus did. It's a call to not give up. Jesus didn't give up. So whenever people don't treat you right for doing right, don't let that stop you from doing right. You don't give up. You don't give in. You don't give up on God because of it. To this you have been called, verse 21 says. I want to point out four other times in the book of 1 Peter that the Bible says that we've been called by God. The first one is in chapter 1, verse 15. I want to read verses 14 and 15. It says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. First time we meet this concept of being called in the book of 1 Peter, it says God has called us. The holy God has called us. So we've been called by God. The next time we find the concept is in chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God is the one who called us, the holy God, chapter 1, verse 15. To what has he called us? Well, first we find out here it's to privilege. We've been called the great privilege out of darkness into his marvelous light. That makes us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, called by God into a life of privilege. And then in chapter 3, verse 9, Peter instructs, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. God called us. He called us to a life of privilege. God called us to blessing. God wants to bless us. And then in chapter 5, verse 10, finally Peter is going to say, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To what have we been called? eternal glory in Christ. It's great to be called by God. There's nothing better. But right in the middle of all of that, in chapter 2, verse 21, and also in these other verses we've been reading, they're suffering. Just because you've been called by God... Just because you've been called to a life of privilege, just because God wants to bless you, and just because he wants to, to give you eternal glory in Christ Jesus, doesn't mean you should expect to avoid suffering for doing right. To this you were called. 
to endure suffering like our example, Jesus, to endure it walking in his footsteps. Jesus is the example of how to endure suffering. How did Jesus respond? Well, let's look at verses 22 and 23 back in chapter 2. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus suffered. If you do good and endure suffering for it, grace of God is active in your life. And then in these two verses, Jesus endured it with no sin, with no deceit, with no insults, with no threats, just trust, just trust in God. There was never a time when Jesus decided, that's all I can take. There was never a time when Jesus thought he had no choice but to sin. In every situation, he chose to do good and to do right and leave the results to God. He committed no sin. Now, let's think for a moment about suffering for doing right. Do you ever suffer for doing right? You do sometimes at work, at school, at home. Somebody in whose presence you've done right or to whom you do right doesn't take it right. And they mistreat you for what you're doing. Well, well then what do you do? Sometimes it seems like, like nothing hurts more than being mistreated for doing right. Well, when someone sins in that way, does... Does that cause you to sin in response? Does it cause you to be deceitful, unlike Jesus, so that you will uh, lie about what you've really done just so, so this person won't be mad at me anymore, won't mistreat me now? Does it cause you to say something that's not true about them? Does it cause you to, to insult that person? Does it cause you to, to threaten? Well, if it does in any of those moments, then, then that's not following the example of Jesus. That's not walking in the, in the footsteps of Jesus at all. Someone illustrated our Christian life this way. It's like God has given you a $1,000 bill. And you as a Christian have this thought that, that uh, this thousand dollar bill is for you, Lord, and, and I would give my thousand dollars for you. That is, you would, you'd give your life and martyrdom for him. But the one who was uh, drawing out this illustration said, yeah, it's like God gives you a thousand dollar bill, that's your life, but then he sends you to the bank to change it out for quarters and you spend your thousand dollars for the Lord a quarter at a time in, in little situations, seemingly so, that might cause you to suffer a little bit, not the ultimate in, in giving your life once and for all for Jesus, but in the moments, like in the moments when somebody would mistreat you for doing right. You decide, I'm not going to, to lie. I'm, I'm going to be truthful. And you spend a quarter that way. And you decide, I'm not going to heap insults on them. I'm going to refrain from that. I'm, I'm even going to return a blessing. And you spend another quarter. And you're not going to threaten them to do something more than, than what they have done to you. You spend another quarter. That is how we sacrifice for the Lord. I won't lie. I won't insult. I won't make threats. I won't do that in person. 
I won't do that behind their back. I won't do that on, on social media. I'm going to be like Jesus and walk in his footsteps. I want to be like Jesus, and nobody's sin against me will make me sin against God. I'll, I'll just trust him to handle everything. That's what it said at the end of verse 23 about Jesus. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. God, Jesus knew, was going to do the right thing. And following Jesus' example, walking in his footsteps, I'm going to do the right thing. How many moments in my life, how many moments in your life would turn out differently if we thought more often about Jesus suffering for us? Verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. One reason that I need the first day of every week the Lord's day, and that you do too, is because by the Lord's plan, we go to the cross of Christ every Lord's day. We think about how He suffered for us, how He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We're healed by His wounds. How many of our moments would see better decisions, decisions that honor God, if we realize not only that Jesus is our example and our Savior, but He's our shepherd. He's watching. He's waiting us to lead, waiting to lead us in every moment. Verse 25 says, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's not easy to learn to endure suffering like Jesus. The process is improved when we think more about Jesus suffering for us. And when we think more about Jesus present to help us through the suffering. We can read Scripture and we know it was hard for Peter to learn it. We'll finish up here in 1 Peter 2 in, in just a moment. Turn back with me to Mark chapter 8. Peter's friend, Mark, Peter's brother in Christ, Mark, tells us about some interactions of Peter with Jesus. When suffering was just being discussed, when suffering was imminent, when suffering had arrived, uh, Peter was, an easy, was not an easy sell for this truth that he's proclaiming in 1 Peter chapter 2. In Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. That's just what Jesus wanted to hear Peter say. But then Jesus is going to say something that Peter never wanted to hear Jesus say. Verse 30, he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus sure wanted to hear Peter say, You are the Christ. Peter sure did not want to hear Jesus say, The Son of Man's going to suffer many things. At the hands of the chief priests, the scribes, the elders. Peter knew he'd never seen Jesus do anything wrong. He couldn't visualize that Jesus would do anything wrong that would result in that kind of treatment. And Peter was right about that. But he was going to suffer. And he was going to suffer according to the plan of God. And he was going to suffer for our sins. Suffering is not outside the plan of God. 
responding to it the wrong way is not God's plan for us. But Jesus was going to suffer. And unless Peter could learn the lesson about suffering and endurance through suffering, all he's ever going to have in mind is Satan's plan, Satan's things, not the plan of God. So it all begins to, to fall out what Jesus prophesied here in Mark chapter 14. Go there and read with me from verse 47. Peter's not named by Mark, but we remember this is him from our reading of the other Gospels. Jesus has been praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, an agonizing prayer about this suffering that's coming. He wanted to handle it right. Well, now Judas the betrayer has shown up with those into whose hands he's going to betray them. How does Peter react to it? Verse 46, they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by, that's Peter, drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. You see, the suffering has begun for Jesus, and Jesus is going to endure it the way that God wants him to. But Peter wants to interrupt. And whenever there is a threat, he's going to respond with more than a threat. And that's what he did with that sword when he cut off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Good thing Jesus was there for Malchus. But then we go toward the end of chapter 14, verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. Now, as we pause right there, how is Peter responding to the suffering that he's seen started for Jesus and just might sweep me up into it right now? He denies. He responds with deceit, not like Jesus. Verse 69, And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you're one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. And those were powerful tears, he cried. And from there and through everything else he saw that day and what he experienced that weekend, Peter changed his mind about suffering and the plan of God. He was a hard, hard sell. He didn't want any of that. But it was God's will. So when we think about the lesson that he's teaching us in 1 Peter chapter 2, we know that it was a hard one for him to learn. But the lesson is don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give up on God. To suffer just like Jesus, is to endure it just like Jesus, without sin. Never heard this before, but a, a speaker named Calvin Miller, whose, whose words I, I read this last week, said there are too many people who think they're Christians, but really they're just Christaholics. A Christaholic. What's a Christaholic? That's somebody who wants Jesus and, and needs Jesus just for the good feelings they can get out of it. Makes me feel better about myself. Makes me uh, have some pleasurable moments, maybe with other people like this. But they're just in it for the feel. They're not ready to suffer. Not ready to endure it with patience like Jesus did. Are you a Christaholic or are you a Christian, a, a Christian? I'm one who's like Christ. I'm one who follows Christ. I walk in his footsteps. He sets the example. 
and I won't turn from him. Even when it doesn't feel good, he's my savior. He's my shepherd. He gets all of me no matter what. Are you a Christian this morning? Peter will use that word in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, but not before he has said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, Baptism now saves you. Not as a washing away of the filth of the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can say you're a Christian when you've been baptized, when your endeavor is to live with the good conscience that God has given you when he washed away your sins by the blood of, of Christ. That's where faith leads you. That's what repentance will make you want to do. That's what you'll want to do upon your confession of Christ, to be baptized into Christ. Are you ready to do that this morning? If you're a fellow Christian and you're hurting, you're suffering because you've done wrong or because you've done right or just because you're a human being trying to endure what humans do, we want to pray for you this morning. Jesus is your shepherd and, and he wants to be here to help. Can we help you get his help this morning? We'd love to do that. We're singing a song to encourage you to make your needs known. You can come to the front while we stand and sing.